Right, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Mel Mason, and uh, I'm the Vice Chair of West Midlands Butterfly Conservation. Now, the, uh, my talk is called, What Have the Lepidoptera Ever Done For Us? And if you've ever seen the film, The Life of Brian, you'll understand the nature of the question. And is conservation working on the Malden Hills? Well, what have the Lepidoptera ever done for us? Well, butterflies and moths are pollinators, and they're at the basis of many our food, of our food chains. And like all insects, they're important for our very own survival. They're excellent indicators of a healthy environment, and they're important to our mental well-being. And I'm sure many of you, like me, have found that out particularly in recent years. And one has recently saved millions of lives. It's the fall army moth, a pest of maize. And it's been used to develop the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. Now, you may have heard of this quote before. So it goes like this. If we and the rest of the backboned animals were to disappear, the rest of life would get on pretty well. But if the invertebrates, including our butterflies and moths, were to disappear, the world's ecosystems would collapse. And it's this quote from Sir David Attenborough, of course, which turns our question on its head. Not what have the Lepidoptera ever done for us, but what have we ever done for the Lepidoptera. Well, there are two conservation projects on the Malvern Hills that we're very much involved in. And one is for the Malvern Grayling, Hipparchia semele, which is classed as vulnerable. In fact, it's more recently been classed as endangered. And it's on one of the most remote sites in the whole of the UK. It's become extinct in neighbouring Herefordshire, Gloucestershire, Warwickshire, Staffordshire. And our other very important conservation project is the Malden Hills Lost Fertilarish Project, where we want to reintroduce one of three fertilities we lost at the end of last century, beginning of this century. The pearl bordered, the small pearl bordered, and our most at risk fertility, the high brown fertility. But let's go back 170 years to when the Malvern Naturalist Field Club was set up in 1852. At that time, 47 species were recorded around the Malvern Hills. And 30 years later, they put 46 of these species into the form of a calendar, whereby month by month, we could see the butterflies we might find if we went out searching for them. Now, most of these are very familiar to us, but the ones in red have now become locally extinct or even nationally extinct, such as the bath white, the black veined white, the large tortoiseshell, the Camberwell beauty, and the pale clouded yellow. Now, if you want to see all these butterflies from 170 years ago, well, the best place is probably the archive collections at Worcester Museum. And this particular one contains all of those 46 species and a few more from other sites. More recently, I was made caretaker of a collection from the late Lee Plesner, given by his brother, Keith. Now, Lee was a lepidopterist in Finland for about 40 years, but in his youth, he collected butterflies from around Worcestershire including this wonderful set of wood white collected on the Malverns in the mid 20th century when this particular species was considered common. Now, of course, we lost this species before the end of last century, along with all other sites in Worcestershire. But with more informed ideas of the habitat management and equally importantly, putting that habitat management into practice, the wood white has successfully been reintroduced onto two sites in Worcestershire 
at Monkwood and at Grafton Wood. And after just a few years, we can now go and expect to find two healthy generations of wood white on these sites in Worcestershire. And it's this kind of proactive habitat management that we hope we're employing in our reintroduction of one of our three lost fritillaries. Now, by the 1960s, we were down to 40 species, but then we lost the Camberwell beauty, the large tortoise shell, and then the purple emperor, although one was recorded in the Morlands this year. So by the 80s, we were down to 37 species, but it still included the most at risk butterfly species in the UK, the high brown fritillary. And this was a picture taken by Matthew Oates. Thank you, Matthew, in 1986. We still hang on to our dark green fritillary, but in very, very small numbers. And these are the six butterflies we've lost in most recent times. Our three fritillaries, the wood white, but also the grizzled skipper and the wall, although wall has been seen on two occasions in the past three years. At the beginning of the century, the Essex skipper arrived, and it's now one of our most common summer species and even exceeds numbers of small skipper on some sites. So today we're up to 33 butterfly species, and we celebrate the abundance and diversity of these species in 15 butterfly transect sites around the Malvern Hills, generating up to 40,000 records, transect records that is, per year. We have a free ID chart with lots of information about where to find our butterflies. And let's have a look now, a little more at the Morgan grading before we go on to the fritillary. And this store is a kind of linked. Now the Morgan grayling is on one of the most remote inland col um, colonies, as I said in the, sorry, sites in the UK, as I said earlier. The two sexes are often difficult um, to distinguish, but in fact, the male does have a very vivid zigzag gray stripe on the underside of its hind wing, which is less distinct in the female. And it has two black eye spots uh, with white pupils, although one is generally missing on the male, but it's their behavior, which usually shows us very clearly the difference between the two. And if we want to see their upper wings, the more attractive upper wings, then we see those during courting. And this is when the male opens its wings to reveal its dark sex brands, which is envelops around the antennae of the female, as we can see in the left-hand picture. Pheromones are very quickly transmitted and mating takes place very quickly after that. But all too often, um, we're seeing the male pursuing the female and carrying out this courting process over a long period of time, presumably with a female that's already mated and already fertilized. If you want to see the caterpillars of the grayling, then really the only time you'd have any success is in the fifth instar before it pupates at the end of May, but it's nocturnal. And so this is a midnight um, survey. I think the caterpillar of the grayling looks a little bit like a mint humbug. It's got these wonderful cream and brown stripes and a very smooth, hairless body. But so far, I haven't tried one. Let's have a look at the egg lay of the grayling butterfly. This is a rocky ridge called the Chat Valley. This is typical, a female laying the egg on what looks like dead sheep specimen, but it's not. It's very much alive, and this is typical egg laying behavior. And as we move nearby to Grayling Rock, appropriately called, we see similar egg laying behavior, laying on sheep specimen larval host plant on a southern edge of the crag or rock face. This is about 330 meters. And as we go down to the lowest level where they're laying eggs, we're at Ivy Scar Rock at about 230 meters. Again, the same egg laying behavior. And we can see the typical female markings during those two clear white pupils.
Well, the habitat management for our grayling depends on a large group of volunteers during the winter months that clear the scrub and the bramble from around our rocky ridges and help um, to allow the finer grasses to grow, particularly the sheep's fescue. Now, this was taken from the east side of um, Worcestershire Beacon, looking towards the North Hill site where the grayling um, are there in numbers. And we see that all these rocky ridges face the south and uh, get most of the sun during the late spring and summer, get very warm, and that's very important to the survival of the butterfly. Now, back in January and March, 2020, just before lockdown, we had several work parties whereby we were removing the low growing scrub to reveal the bare rock and finding underneath the dry humus. Nothing unusual there, except in the dry humus in January, we were finding adult ichneumon wasps. And one type is shown in the top left hand corner is ichneumon xanthorius. And the one in the middle is ichneumon suspiciosus. Now these are well-known larval parasitoids of moth larvae. Now we don't know a lot about their association with butterflies, but I would suggest that if they're parasitoids of moth larvae, they'll take every advantage of graving, grayling larvae in the very sites where in fact they seem to be in diapause over the winter period. And sure enough, when I went out searching on all the, all the grayling sites, I was finding these in huge numbers. Remember, this is the depth of winter. Um, I predicted that this would significantly affect the population. Now, the Newman Xanthoris is a very, very attractive wasp. And sure enough, we've got um, lots of pictures on the left hand side here, which are um, affecting the graph. So the graph took a huge decline in uh, 2020, and it didn't recover last year in 2021. But whether this is a correlation or a straw in the camel's back, I'm not clear. But it's not the cause of the what looks to be the extinction of the grayling on the Malden Hills. So what's the next step? Well, the habitat has never looked better, not since I've been involved in the past 10 years. And butterfly conservation are very wary of a top up on the Malden site because of the possible, the possibility of introducing unknown parasites or even chemical contamination. For instance, the nearest site in Shropshire is at the bog near a lead mine, which is contaminated with cadmium, arsenic, and strontium. But it's in such, such, such small amounts in the butterfly, just a few parts per million, which I don't think bears any risk whatsoever. So what is the next step if we want to avoid extinction? Well, I don't see a way forward without a top up to give our existing population a chance and to improve the genetic mix. Now, butterfly conservation have a strategy over the next five years to half the number of threatened species, to improve the condition on 100 of our most important landscapes, and to transform 100,000 butterfly sites. Well, I hope after considering the scientific evidence, there is more of an emphasis on natural England's strategic direction, which I think applies to our grayling. And this clearly states, our work demands a change in mindset, away from a sometimes over precautionary approach towards one that is prepared to take risks and sustain some losses in order to secure greater gains. Okay, well, on to the fritillaries. I said we wanted to reintroduce one of our three lost fritillaries from the end of last century, beginning of this century. And this project started again at the beginning of lockdown. And in order to kick the project, project off the ground, we had to ask some 
important questions. Now, Professor Jeremy Thomas, back in the late 80s and early 90s, wrote a book called Butterflies of Britain and Ireland. You probably know it's a wonderful book. And in it, he said, the Morgans is one of the few places where high brown fritillary can be seen in any numbers sweeping up the hillsides or buttering around gaps in the bracken. It is heartening to know that the management of this area is specifically designed to encourage this and other fritillaries. Specifically designed. Within 10 years, we lost the high brown, the pearl bordered and the small pearl bordered. And in the revised edition in 2014, which is again a fantastic book, he said it was evidently a much harder task than was envisaged in those optimistic days. A huge understatement. Well, this is the Malvern Hills, um, a view um, often seen by any motorist going up and down the M5 motorway. And this was taken from near Junction 7 on Whittington Tump. And we can see the ridge of the hills extending from North Hill, 14 kilometers south, as far as Chase End Hill. That's about nine miles in old money. Now, as we step up onto North Hill, we're treading on igneous rock. Igneous rock that was formed 700 million years ago near the Antarctic. And over that time, it's moved north across the equator and it's now ready to bump into the Arctic. Now it gets its triple SI status from its acidic grasslands that support a particular flora and fauna, including here, our grayling, and also small heath, which uses the same larval host plant, sheep's fescue, which is very much a part of the acidic grassland. As we look east across Worcestershire, the Severn Valley, we look towards the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire at a limestone ridge, a mere 200, 250 million years old, which supports a more alkaline flora and fauna. But as we look west from North Hill, we're looking across Herefordshire, which is intensively farmed in places towards the Welsh borders and Hay Bluff on the skyline. But as we look south along the ridge of the hills, we're looking towards British Camp or Herefordshire Beacon. And just to the right, we can see the large stone monument called the Obelisk in East North Park. Now, this was a former stronghold of our three lost fritillaries. By the way, in the upper right hand corner here, what looks like the silhouette of a submarine emerging from the mist is May Hill in Gloucestershire. Now, as we move to the southern end of the hills, we're on Chase End Hill, and this was a second former stronghold of our three lost fritillaries. And it's quite close to the obelisk and the East Nor Estate. In fact, it's just about two kilometres within flight distance of our three lost fritillaries, and that's very, very important. Now, our third former stronghold of our fritillaries is to the east or to the right of this picture, across Ragged Stone Hill, across Midsummer Hill, to the eastern slopes of Swinyard Hill. And it's these three sites that whereby we hope to set up an effective meta population. What does that mean? Well, when we reintroduce one of our three lost fritillaries, we need to give it every chance we can to survive into the long term. On any one particular site, the butterfly will have choices of different microhabitats. Some will be drier, some will be damper, some will be more sheltered, some will be less sheltered, some will be warmer, some will be cooler. And the fritillary needs those choices, as every year the weather can be different, and the number of par parasites present can be different, the flora can be different. It needs to have 
those microhabitats where it can make choices. But in extreme weather events, and we keep having those all the time, and last year was one of the worst springs ever for pearl border fritillary, then our fritillary needs to have, needs to be able to have choices. And those choices come about if it can move to nearby sites to interact with those sites, which will have different conditions, and also to interact with different colonies. So we need to build up a very, very effective metapopulation by establishing three sites with what we hope will be three different colonies. Now, every year since their extinction, we've been carrying out a survey for the larval host plant, bog violet. And as you can see from this picture, there's no shortage of dog violets on the Malvern Hills. So what were those important questions we had to ask at the beginning of our project? Well, the first was obvious. Why did our fritillaries become extinct? And if we can't answer this, perhaps we don't, we don't have um, a chance of uh, getting our project off the ground. Which fritillary will succeed if we reintroduce? Because we can't reintroduce all three at the same time. Is it a habitat problem? If so, what can we do about it? Where are our receptor sites? Well, I've already mentioned three, and those are our three receptor sites now, where landowners have changed, and modified their habitat management. Very importantly, where are our donor sites? Where are our partner sites where we can share good practice with and where they can help us, particularly in the initial stages, by offering gravid females to kick off our captive larval breeding program? And do we have support from our partner organizations, as well as the landowners and land managers on the receptor sites and the donor sites? Butterfly Conservation, Natural England, Malden Hills AONB, there's a whole, whole array of them, including all our funding providers, and we have quite a number now. And can we start now? We didn't want to unnecessarily wait year after year for more and more discussion. Well, during our research, we looked at a huge amount of data and records, but by far the most interesting was from Digby Wood. Thank you, Digby, the late Digby Wood, I should say, who walked two of the sites, one on Swinyard Hill and on East North Park. And when we took his records and put them into a graphical form, what they showed us was the 15 years from 1987 of all three fertilities to their final, ex final extinction. Surprisingly, perhaps, the most abundant was the high brown fertility. Now, we may easily get led astray. And we looked through lots and lots and lots of reports. And in this 1986 report, it describes a father and two children carrying away 12 high brown fertility in a killing bottle. Now, I've no doubt this could easily have been the last straw on the camel's back that affected a very, very vulnerable population of fritillaries. But it wasn't the reason they became extinct. I think this graph tells us much, much more. This is a graph from BC, Butterfly Conservation, showing the abundance of UK butterfly populations from 1976 onwards. The red line are the wider countryside species and the blue line are our specialist habitat species. And our 60 species in the UK are split about half and half. Now, 1976 was an extreme weather event. Like me, you might remember, it was very hot, very dry for a long period of time. Now, before 1976, the 100 line represents what we can see, consider the average count for many years beforehand. But after 1976, populations dropped by 60%. And a few years later, it went to 80% reduction with our specialist species, and it's not recovered since. And what this graph shows us are two things. One is 
that even by the mid 70s, because of all the reasons we know, uh, particularly widespread use of chemicals and intensive farming methods, our wider and wilder countryside had already become so fragmented that populations that were lost after 1976 didn't have a hope of recovery because there was no nearby colony to support that recovery. And secondly, the habitat management was poor or non-existent on these sites. And that's what's affected so many of our specialist species and also you can see our wider countryside species. And it's these two things we're trying to remedy on the Malden Hills. Now, if you go searching for fritillaries, you'll always come across this bracken. And many people think of bracken as the enemy. It's not. It will increase biodiversity. It's poor habitat management, which is the enemy. Now, at the beginning of our project, when we were allowed, we did lots and lots of surveying, looking at our bracken sites and our three former strongholds. And from all these surveys, we shared everything with our partners, all our partners. We shared our photographs, our videos, and our reports. The conclusion uh, that we came to was that if a reintroduction to take place, it should be the pearl border fritillary. The habitat on the Mormons isn't that different from um, the site at Lewis Harold in Herefordshire and also at a site in North Worcestershire at Wire Forest. And we're all similar in climatic terms. So what is it about the pearl bordered fritillary? Well, I said it was endangered, and the figures show why. In terms of population abundance, we've lost nearly three quarters of them since 1976, and they're only present now on less than 10% of the sites, going back 45 years. It gets its name from these seven pearls on the underside of the hind wing on the margin. But there's also a wonderful pearl in the middle, as well as a very attractive pattern. And if we look more closely, I hope what you can see is what looks like the outline of a duck's head and bill with a black eye just there. And what you've got, once you've got this image in your mind, it's something you'll always use as one of your identification features of the pearl border fritillary. Now it used to be known as the April fritillary way back in the early 18th century when it used to emerge at the end of April. But in the mid 18th century, our calendar was advanced by 11 days for meteorological reasons and because the Pope told us so. And so the end of April became the beginning of May and the April fritillary became the May fritillary. I think you've guessed the next bit. With a warming climate and earlier springs, in recent years, the pearl border fritillary has been emerging much earlier at the end of May, uh, sorry, at the end of April, rather than the beginning of May, and it's now the April fritillary again. Its life cycle is fairly straightforward. The butterfly is in flight in April, May and early June, and it's mating and it's egg laying and the eggs hatch out into the first instar. They molt three times over June and July until they form the fourth instar, which then goes into diapause. Now diapause is that resting state. And hopefully it's going to go into resting state underneath um, bracken litter or leaf litter, whereby it will stay that way until the following February or March. And then it emerges to feed on violets. It undergoes another molt to form the fifth instar before it pupates and emerges as the adult butterfly to complete the cycle. But this is a fritillary that seems to have adapted to, flood, to emerging as the adult in one of our coldest times 
of the butterfly season in spring. When the season can be very cold and very damp and wet, particularly as we saw last spring, one of our worst on record. So how does it do this? Well, this is a hairy footed flower bee. And I took this picture this time last year as it emerged from a drill hole in the south facing side of my bungalow. And it was on a day when the air temperature was 6.3 degrees centigrade. But during sunny moments, the surface on the south side went to over 40 degrees centigrade. Now, how can this possibly happen? Well, you need to understand that our air around us is not heated directly by the sun. The air around us is heated from the ground. So the sun's energy passes through the air. It warms the ground, which gets much, much warmer than the air. And that is conducted to the air layer above and convected to higher to the higher atmosphere. So the ground will always be much, much warmer than the air. And insects, like our hairy footed flower bee, remain in that drill hole until they've got enough energy to go out, and as they did the other day in my garden, seek the first nectar from the pulmonaria that's growing. And so our pearl border fritillary is exactly the same. The caterpillars emerge on sunny moments on dry bracken litter or leaves, where they bask on the ground to gain the warmth from the ground, sufficient warmth for the caterpillars to feed and for the butterflies to fly and seek nectar and caught and mate and lay eggs. So on this particular site, it was a cool day. It was less than 11 degrees C, but the bracken was already at 30 and later on it climbed to 40. It's not the only butterfly that does this. Um, our grayling does it that at the height of summer rather than spring, and the grayling butterfly needs to reach a body temperature of 32 degrees centigrade in order to carry out all of its activities. Now, this was a June day. By the way, notice June, because in recent years, the grayling has been coming out regularly at the end of June, which was unheard of 10 years and more ago. So it was 19 degrees C, but the rocky surfaces, particularly where this black lichen is, where the butterflies like to perch, absorbs more of the sun's radiation because it's dark and emits more of the radiation, so it gives more warmth to the butterfly. And it was near 40 degrees C. This is midsummer, when the air temperature was 31 degrees centigrade. Look at the temperature of the service. This is near the top of North Hill, 63 degrees centigrade. This was the first time I've ever seen a female grayling lay an egg in a shady area. Back to the pearl border. These are pictures I've taken from various um, donor sites, including the Bathurst estate. Um, Bugle is reputed to be one of its favourites, and sure enough, it does like Bugle a lot. But in fact, it's not fussy. The most popular nectar source I saw on all sites was the dandelion. There's a good reason for that. During the spring, it's in profusion, out in flower. It loves ground ivy, and the mulberries is absolutely covered in it, and it will quite happily take nectar from a violet flower, while the caterpillar will nibble the leaves. Well, where are our donor sites? Well, these are our potential donor sites. Now, we started our captive larval breeding last year in one of the worst years when sites just didn't reach their threshold values. But the wire forest managed to release four gravid females, which kicked us off in a big way. And Egolfa are, have said, because we've been visiting, we've been report writing, we've been sharing all our findings, um, have offered this year um, to provide gravid females as well. And we're working with Lewis Harold on the same project. And I'm really pleased to say that Bath Percy State have come on board as well. And I hope we form a large partnership where we can share best practice on all the activities that we're carrying out, particularly with the captive larval breeding program. 
Well, I said earlier on, Bracken is not the enemy. And this, and here I am um, searching the Bracken sites when the Bracken is six to seven feet high. This is Ewes Harrell in Herefordshire. And the Bracken here doesn't look any different to me from the Malden site, but it's what's underneath that's important. And when you look underneath on a good breeding site, what you see is bracken or leaf litter with the violets pushing through, the tail, tail signs of caterpillars eating, and a high canopy of bracken in the summer, shading the violets, which are shade tolerant, and suppressing the growth of grasses and scrub. This is why a forest, a couple of weeks later, the bracken now is much more higher and thicker. But when we look underneath, similarly, we see the bracken litter, the telltale signs of caterpillars feeding, and we see leaves. Well, it is surrounded by woodland, but it is a huge area. And the leaves act like the bracken litter in providing basking sites, sites in which they overwinter underneath, just like the bracken litter. Let's have a look at some of these sites. This is a goal for in Montgomeryshire. This, is, this was last year during the spring. Yes, dandelions, a favorite nectar source. Lots of violets, absolutely essential. I was allowed to catch a butterfly. I was given permission by the warden, but it was released. That's a male with an elongated abdomen. Beautiful sight this. It was actually a cold day. You can see we were wearing gloves. This is why a forest. I was seeing lots. This is a male. I was seeing lots of gravid females laying eggs, taking from bugle. And it gave that here we are. There's a female laying eggs. And although you can't see the violets, they are tucked underneath that leaf litter. Here's another one laying eggs. Gave the false impression of being a really good year. This is Ewes Harold in Herefordshire. Attempt at courting there. Again, dandelions, a favorite nectar source. Okay, more egg laying in Ewes Harold, Her Herefordshire. There's a typical female, shorter abdomen and stouter, full of eggs, taking nectar from a violet. This is Bathurst. This is last spring. I think this is a marvelous sight. Now, I, I was seeing here in a very small area, quite a number of females laying eggs, like this one here. Now, you need to keep your eye on the egg, otherwise you'll never find it. Here's another one laying eggs. And I was interested in recording the gravid females laying eggs and where they were laying eggs. And often it wasn't on the food plant, it was very close to. Attempt at courting there, and mating. Okay, well, back on the Malvins 18 months ago, this was my Goldilocks test for good habitat on the Malvins in assessing it for a reintroduction. This site we went to had too much grass. We can see the bracken litter, we can see the violets pushing through, but there's lots of grass, grass encroaching on the site and ruining it. And this is because the bracken was cut too often and it wasn't forming an effective canopy in the summer. This site had too much litter. It hadn't been cut for a long time. The litter was building up. It was forming a mulch the scrub was growing through, the violets didn't have a chance. But this site we found was just right. Lots of violets pushing through the um, bracken litter and a good canopy of bracken above in the summer to maintain this breeding site and suppress the growth of grasses and scrub. <coughs> now, look at this, excuse me. This is a site on the East Norris Estate, and it's last March. 
And when I looked at this at this time, I knew it was potentially a good site, but it'd been cut to within an inch of its life, and the violets seemed to have disappeared through sheep grazing. Look what happened. This is April 2021. Snow on the ground in places. This site is bare. But then, come July, the habitat management had changed, the sheep had disappeared, and I took there a group of volunteers to, the here. Here. to go and look to see what wow. they find. A bird cut each year or something. These, no, the violets very good, reappeared in mass and they were sweeping up the hillside under the bracken canopy. Oh, that's a lovely patch, isn't it? Just really good. Up in there as well. One of our reasons. No, that's very good, isn't it? This was all short stuff. Begin to think, see why. Now, not all bracken sites look like this. Now, we didn't see anything like this when we came in this spring. Is no, it's bracken is ideal here. now. Yeah, yeah. And the bracken litter is looking good in places. Now, I this has all the potential, regularly. doesn't it? But here is in September. The land manager had cut a path through it for us. And by the side of the path in the autumn, we're seeing this mass of violets that had appeared, no longer grazed. And then in October, the bracken is really dying down now, but the violets are remaining and it's forming the perfect breeding site. We're forming squashed down areas of bracken and raised up bracken, forming sheltered sites for the caterpillars emerging next spring. Now this is near the obelisk in the East Hill site. And as we look south, we're looking towards Bay Sand Hill. And this bit of Bay Sand Hill is in Gloucestershire. And you can see that the southern slopes have been put over now to bracken and violets only. It's looking really good. You may know the East Hill estate. Very, very attractive site. Well, so what did we do next? We started our captive larval breeding program. In fact, we started from the very, very first summer in 2020, when we asked volunteers to grow violets. And we had about 15 volunteers growing hundreds and hundreds of violets. And then the following spring, we set up our breeding pots. With the violets, we washed them. We washed them in a little bit of berry liquid to get rid of any trace of predator or fly. And then we rinse them very carefully and we put them into tents to keep them away from any parasitoids. Here's some I photographed on the netting. These are little wasps that would um, parasitize our caterpillars. So they are the enemy. We have to get rid of them. And we placed our washed violets into sterile compost with microwaved oak leaves. We microwave the oak leaves in order to kill and remove any trace of little invertebrates or parasitoids. We then introduced a nectar source and our first gravid female. Here it is from the wire forest. And our gravid female happily took the nectar and happily laid on the violets under some very, very good insect netting. After eight days of laying eggs, we released one of our heterogametic females that's a female with the WZ sex chromosomes to the Sanger Institute um, at Cambridge. And this particular pearl border fritillary will be the first to have a complete genome sequence. It was taken away and killed in dry ice at minus 80 degrees C, transported to Liverpool and then to the, the Sanger Institute and the Tree of Life project. Well, eggs were laid from day one on the netting, which we didn't want, but also on the violets. Within two weeks, we had the first instar appearing. Sorry, within one week, we had the first instar appearing. And you must realize this is only two millimeters long, this caterpillar. It is incredibly small. After two weeks, the second instar appeared, and then the enemy arrived. These are actual photographs of the predators I found in one of our pots. And it is the larva of these predators um, that ate many of our first and second instarts 
in one of our pots. Lesson learned. Another two weeks, the third instar appeared, and about another two weeks towards the end of July, the fourth instar appeared, and then they went into diapause. At this stage, they had shrunk already to about a centimeter from being just over a centimeter. And by the end of winter, they shrunk to about eight millimeters. Let's have a look. So there is the first okay. of four gravid females. And now we can see the actual first instar appearing from the egg. Look at the, this is a green fly just here. So you get a scale of the size. The second instar is very characteristic, very characteristic, as you will see with the third instar, which is much blacker and spikier. Still on the second instar there. There we are, we're on to the third instar. I think a really attractive caterpillar. You'll no doubt get some protection from those spikes. There's the telltale signs of it eating. And then we've got the fourth instar. And very soon after this, it went into diapause. Oh, God, look at that lot. They were all in diapause. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Four there. Here we were translocating them so to a fresh have... pot of violets, where I hoped that would maintain them over the winter period. But in fact, over the autumn, they kept emerging during a very mild autumn to feed again, and we had to move them again onto more pots. Well, we established this as a matter of experimentation, and it's actually at the Pearl Hotel, we called it, to hold all out violet pots and breeding pots. That's how it looked last August. And this is how it's looking now. It's become a much more organized affair. And in fact, we have an annex to the Pearl Hotel inside my conservatory, where we're bringing on lots and lots of pots of violets ready for these caterpillars, which are voracious eaters once they emerge in the spring. There's our first violet flower. By the way, you can see the cleft spur here, very typical, and the pointed sepals. Our caterpillars, as I've said, have already started feeding again. Let's have a quick look. This was two days ago. This was the field just two days ago. So here they are in one of our breeding pots. They're basking on the oak leaves during any warm moment, and they're starting to feed. That was just two yeah, days ago. Bring them into the warmth, and suddenly they're all coming out. Coming out, yeah. To bask and feed. Just about to translocate these to a new pot of violets. Okay, what's next? Well, they'll feed a lot, they'll molt, and they'll form these very attractive spiky, yellow spiky caterpillars before they pupate and then emerge as butterflies. When we'll take the females in particular and put them in a netted cage for one day with a couple of males, allow them to mate so that when we release them on site, they're already fertilized and ready to lay eggs rather than out looking for a mate. We've raised over 18,000 pounds over the past year, um, and our funding providers are largely from the local community, our local council, a local landowner, um, the Malden Hills area of standing up beauty, a supermarket, Waitrose supermarket, and many, many, many volunteers have given to the project. We've had a lot of good publicity, including BBC Countryfile, at the end of December. So is this project important? Well, obviously, yes, but why? Well, we're trying to bring back some of our wildlife. 
were trying to decrease the decline in biodiversity. We're trying to improve the environment and increase connectivity locally, as I've already expect, explained in setting up a meta population, um, and also wider afield. The big dream in the future is to establish more pearl sites around the area so that we can link through wildlife corridors, perhaps as far as the Bathurst Estate or the Herefordshire site or the North Worcestershire site. That's the big picture, but that's very, very ambitious. But we certainly want to share good practice. We want to show how landowners can modify their habitat management. And I have to say, we've been waiting a generation for our landowners to do this, and they're finally doing it. And I've already said it's very much community funded and supported by volunteers. If you want to find out more, just go to Malden Butterfly Group Facebook. There's constant updates there on this and other activities around the Moldens. Now I want to leave you with an interpretation of David Attenborough's quote. If the invertebrates were to disappear, then the world's ecosystems would collapse. And if that was to happen, if we were to allow it to happen, then this might be a conversation between one of our surviving graylings and one of our reintroduced pearl border fritillaries. Thank you. That's where I'm finishing.